Hey there, internet friends. Welcome to another episode of That Nerdy Site Show, a weekly podcast where the team members from That Nerdy Site get together to talk about our lives and all of the nerdy things we love about them. I'm your host, Trevor Starkey, and joining me once again, we have Cameron Abbott. How you doing, Cam? Hey, what's going on, Trevor? What is going on? We had a nice Chuck Box lunch, Chuck Box lunch today with uh, my folks. They they were kind enough to treat us to some uh, good old fashioned ASU classic Chuck Box. It uh, was. Hey. It was my first joint. time being there in almost a decade, and it was fantastic. Really appreciate your parents for, you know, taking us. Yeah. Um, and today we're going to be talking all about Dimension 20's Never After, uh, which wrapped up this last week. Uh, this was their horror season um, uh, dedicated to, uh, as Dimension 20 from Dropout typically does, uh, they do like a mashup of, of themes. So for their horror theme, uh, they went all in on like fairy tales. Um, which, you know, works actually better than you would think, uh, especially if they go, uh, they went to the, the source material, uh, like the Grimm's fairy tales and stuff like that. Um, so we're going to be talking about that. We'll have kind of like our, our spoiler free slash a description of the series. If you aren't familiar, uh, first, and then we're going to dive into full spoilers. Uh, so that's kind of what we have to look forward to today. And I think that's pretty much the only topic we'll be chatting about today. Uh, if you like what you hear, please remember to like subscribe, rate review, share the podcast with your friends, all of that fun stuff. Uh, so yeah, spoiler free thoughts first slash, uh, for those that aren't familiar, uh, dimension 20, uh, the actual play series from Dropout, a.k.a. the, like, college humor evolution. Um, uh, Dimension 20 been going for four or five years now, seems like. Um, I don't know how many seasons this this is for them, but they have their, like, kind of core cast of characters, the intrepid heroes, which this series featured, uh, which are Shabon Thompson, uh, Ali Beardsley, Lou Wilson, Zach Ayama, Brian Murphy, and Emily Axford, uh, with Brennan Lee Mulligan as their game master. Uh, Siobhan was playing Princess Rosamond Dupree, aka Sleeping Beauty, in this one. Uh, Ali Beardsley was Mother Timothy Goose. Lou Wilson was Pinocchio. Zach Oyama was Puss in Boots. Brian Murphy was Prince Gerard of Greenlee, a.k.a. the Frog Prince. And Emily Axford was Ilfa Snorgelson, a.k.a. Little Red Riding Hood. Um, uh, yeah, um, Cam, uh, I don't know if you want to, if you have like a, a spoiler free kind of like overview sure. of the season. You you have certainly more actual play experience than I do. So uh, so how would you describe the season to somebody who is unfamiliar with it or would, would be maybe, maybe just getting into it? Yeah, I don't know if that's true. You've watched a lot of Critical true. Role. I've, I've watched, well, yeah, I've, I've watched 100 episodes plus of Critical Role. <laughs> so yeah, yeah maybe, maybe I have watched more actual play I'm, than you I'm almost point. positive at this point you have consumed more actual play content than I have. I mean, I mean I've also watched more D uh, Dimension 20 than you because there are seasons you haven't seen like Pirates of Leviathan and stuff. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Um, I think a big thing about that, especially, um, when you consider actual play, like, I think I might have more of a variety. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've definitely like, I've listened to a little bit of Dungeon Daddies. I've listened to, or Dungeons da and Daddies. I've listened to, uh, a little bit of the, uh, McElroy's various series. Um, I, you know, I, I have a little bit of taste of everything that mm -hmm. I've had. Um, uh, but I have to say like, without a doubt, Dimension 20 is my bread and butter. It's what I always go back to. So, yeah. Um, it was my gateway drug and it's, it's the one that, uh, that has it. I mean, quite literally, uh, in my, I did, a my like favorite actual plays that I watched of last year. And, uh, because it was the first year I'd been like watching it like all year long. And, uh, my number one spoilers for that was, uh, Critical Role's Exandria Unlimited Calamity, uh, which I watched and was my entry point into critical role because Brennan was the the game master for that. So I was like, oh, I really want to see what Brennan does in this space, this like most well renowned um kind of space. And then yeah, from from there I was like, all right, I want to see more about this world and I want to check out some more of these players and see what their like long form stuff is like. So yeah, gotten into a lot of critical role in the last year. Yeah. That was um I have tried critical role Crit critical role is quite like like it for me it is t like i think it's too much it is it is very dense yeah um and it's not that it's if they if it was just a lot of episodes but each episode was like maybe an hour long that would be a lot more appetizing to me mm -hmm. but the fact that each episode's two to four hours and there's well over a hundred of them it's too much 
content um, for me to sit through. Yeah. Uh, and I don't blame anybody for liking or loving. I don't think there's anything wrong. I think that the Matt Mercer effect, though, is real. Please expect less from your DMs. They haven't been doing it for like 30 years. Um, that being also said, also expect more out of your DMs. They shouldn't be lazy. Uh, yeah, when it comes to um, actual play stuff, like especially with Never After, I think Never After is, it's not my least favorite of the actual plays that I've seen from Dimension 20, but it's certainly not my favorite. I think it probably falls really f deep into the middle, which is a really weird place to be. Because I think that there are some smaller seasons or smaller things that I was just like right, really not a fan of and bounced off pretty hard, um, which is a shame because I was really looking forward to them, uh, and not because of lack of quality, but just because like I they're they're trying to play a game in a way that I am not just vibing with. Um, I think a lot of stuff from Shriek Week, uh, they're like they, during a time they were like, hey, we're gonna do a couple of different series that are done by other people. Um, like run by other people. Uh, I think that the people who were running them were very interesting. I just wasn't interested in the game that they were playing. Um, which is not to say it's a bad thing. Like, I think that's actually quite great that there is going to be, like, Dimension 20 is like, we're not just going to have D&D stuff going on. We are going to let people bring new and different types of games into this space mm -hmm. to tell these very different kinds of stories with it. And I think that that's awesome. Um that being said, like, so yeah, with Never After, I think for me, Never After is, I think it's an excellent actual play series. Um, I feel like it, there is a, there is a, a big chunk of the middle part where I felt disassociated with what was going on, but it was intriguing enough, like mentally interesting enough to keep me going and keep me hooked. Mm -hmm. But as far as like the things I usually come for Dimension 24, like these like these deceptively simple characters that they deceive you and think, oh, this is a simple character, but in really in like realizing like really deep depths to them over the course of a long period of time. Uh or I shouldn't say long period, but over like a short period of time, you like really learn interesting things, or the characters are put into certain positions that make their their characters' evolution very interesting. I think an example of that is like in Fantasy High, um, freshman year and sophomore year. I think that there are really great key moments where where certain characters kind of evolve and let themselves grow in a way that was not very apparent. That was the direction that things were going. Um, and I think like Lou Wilson's uh, characters often do this. Um, that being said, I think I, that I think I think we had some of those in this season. Oh, I we think can talk about that more in, in spoiler territory, but for sure. And I don't think that this season is missing that. I just feel like I wasn't vi like that was not the um, what I felt like that was the narrative focus of this season. Mm -hmm. This season gets very meta um, with storytelling as like an idea and concept, um, which I liked. I really liked that aspect of it. I just don't know if it was in synchronization with everything else going on, which is really hard to do. I couldn't imagine doing what, what Brennan tried to do this season. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, but that being said, I think it's definitely still worth watch. I definitely think she, people should watch it. That's my, that's my, uh, like quote unquote, spoiler review, spoiler free review. Yeah. I, uh, I was a big fan of, uh, uh as I said, EXU calamity. And I remember thinking pretty much like, as soon as this first, uh, like the first couple episodes of this one came out, it was like, oh, this is a season of that. This is a season of Brennan really getting to um, to kind of just throw that energy into this whole thing. Um, and uh, I think over that sustained of a run of, uh, I think, 18, 20 episodes by the end. Uh, 18 episodes, I think. Mm -hmm. 18. Um, no, 20 episodes. Oh, yeah, it was 20. Um, uh, it... it it wore a little thin for me in part. I think like horror isn't a genre I typically vibe with anyway. If anything like this was the most palatable version of horror because it's not like jump scares and excessive gore and stuff like it's or it is, but it's in like description and storytelling and minis and stuff like that. So like I was able to sit with those things and it was like it didn't it didn't bother me because i can basically imagine to the extent that i want to imagine these things uh these grotesque things happening um 
uh, and I think the fairy tale aspect was the most like interesting aspect of it for me. And and I think once we started seeing where that went a couple episodes in, uh, which uh, I'll, I'll touch on more in spoiler talk, um, I got very intrigued. But then, yeah, I think it did kind of it. It opened up to such limitless possibilities. But knowing that they still have to hit certain beats and certain like battle sets and stuff like that, it was like, OK, they're like I could kind of see the like, all right you guys want to go do this thing, but I'm going to steer you back this way because I, I, I need to drive the, the, the story to such and such a point. Um, I, I did kind of feel that coming. Um, that said, like, I mean, this was also the first time you and I have watched these, like we watched pretty much every episode together. I think there was like one or two in there, uh, that times didn't work out or something. So, uh, we, we kind of watched independently, like when I was in Disney and stuff. Um, uh, so that was also fun, like this kind of like ritual of us sitting down and watching the episode and, and getting to enjoy it together, I think was uh, was a ton of fun that I will like associate this season with. Mm-hmm. But as we were in like the finale this week, there were definitely like whole, entire episodes that I had kind of like forgotten about and had to go back and be like, what? Yeah, what happened for for that like middle chunk? Um, so I definitely understand what you're what you're saying there. Um, it was still a ton of fun, and oh, yeah. and like uh, all of these uh, are, you know, all these people are master players, um, and and have such great fun at the table and such great chemistry together. Um, so like it was still a very enjoyable, fun time. Um, but this is one I was like, eh, I I wouldn't need, uh, I wouldn't be looking for a season two of this in the way that you know I'm looking, I, I look forward to if they ever go back to Fantasy High or Starstruck Odyssey. Like I think. They told the story that they, you know, told here. And I think that can be it. Um, Mm -hmm. It was fun having them all back in the dome with minis. Uh, That's the first time, like, this crew had been since since the pandemic. So uh, it was fun seeing. And and the the production team, Rick Perry and and his team, continue to just, like, blow things through the roof um, with a couple in particular that I will shout out. Um, But, yeah, it was, like, it... Overall, thematically, a lot of elements of this one didn't vibe with me, but I still had fun week to week watching it. Yeah. It's not one like I've been rewatching Fantasy High uh, recently, um, and I've rewatched, uh, I mean, I've rewatched Calamity a couple times, a number of times actually. Um, uh, and I uh, occasionally rewatch Misfits and Magic. Um, this yeah. is one I don't find myself ever really going no. back to. Like maybe moments here and there. Like there, I think there are some standout like little bits and sequences, um, but if I really want to watch those, I can just scroll back through like the Instagram feed and see which you know videos they pulled as highlights and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's it definitely a fun season and a good way to kick off the year. Uh, it does leave me very excited for the next season that they've already teased is going to be Matt Mercer driven, uh, of course, that's, from Critical Role. That's going to be so wild. And that's all we know about it really that's, at yeah. this point. So, uh, yeah, we have that coming up uh, next month, I think. I think in May. Yeah, um, that's true. Oh, man, we're already there. I'm yeah. so excited. Yep. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's that's uh, Dimension 20 Never After, like, spoiler-free kind of our, our general thoughts. A, a fun season, not in the, like, top tier of Dimension 20 for either of us. Um, but, uh, but still like a good watch, and especially if you like, you like horror. Oh, the other thing I really want to shout out editing across the oh, board yeah. this season was like stellar there, are, they're like, th- because they're playing with like different worlds and different universes and, and stuff, the way they would take, you know, Brennan doing like the same gesture and like edit five or six of those together in like a like rapid succession and you just like see him in different costumes and 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 or different different costumes different is different outfits and stuff um the way they piece that together was like every time it happened i was like oh my god they're like they're just on another level that they were uh really uh up their game this year on the editing side so shout out to especially the editing team on this one it was probably the 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 thing that stood out to me the most. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I, I think definitely production this season's the best it's ever been. Um, yeah, that, um, I think we first started seeing it 
being done in Starstruck, where they were really going and like working with um, like a lot of audio editing was being done in Starstruck that mm-hmm. made it. Uh, it was different. Like Brennan's voice would come across different through like editing. Yeah. Um, whether it was through like what kind of comms it even was, not just like oh it's over comms, so it's gonna have like the staticky voice. It's like is it over radio? Is it over hologram? Is it o-? like whatever they were doing the sound editing on that season was out of this world great. They brought that and more. Yeah. Uh, to this season and this season, like you said, the visual. Even the dome's visuals. Yeah, I was um, gonna say like yeah. the dome has been like evolving ever since like that first season of Mis- Misfits and Magic. I think Abria kind of brought in some ideas, or if not the first season of Misfits and Magic, definitely like the uh, the Halloween special. Uh, uh, the Mis- hall- holiday special. Or, yeah, uh, yeah, holiday. Sorry, not Halloween. Um, it had a horror vibe to it, so <laughs> hence, it's true. Hence me thinking that. Um, but yeah, they like and and they've continued to play with that in this very much was like, a, all right, yeah, we're going to turn the the dome into, in addition to, like, the the cool lighting stuff that we do, we're going to throw in, uh, uh, like, a, a video wall, basically, element of it and projections and stuff like that. When the uh, shadows first come across the first time, it's so sick. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, shout out to, uh, to the whole production team there behind Dimension 20. Uh, so, yeah, uh, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and dive into our spoiler-filled kind of conversation, talk more specifics and nitty-gritty stuff about the season. Uh, if you uh, uh, are ducking out here, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll catch you next week. Hope you have a good one. Uh, but, yeah, uh, spoiler-filled Cam. Um, I mean, I guess spoiler filled. It probably makes most sense to just start from the final battle. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. So, what did you think of the the finale? This last couple parts of the finale here. I think this was probably, in my opinion, the best final battle we've gotten. Um, I think that there is there's something about um, Fantasy High's final battle that is very much like they start off in a rough place and they are in a rough place that entire fight up until the very end. Mm-hmm. Um, when chronomancy is introduced, yeah, uh, there's that um, that element of it. I think the closest they've ever gotten to like a really rough ending was Unsleeping City season one, mm-hmm. um, where yeah, like we lost Steven Sondheim in that one. Really, we thought we did, but then he returned. Oh, I mean, he's doing in a different plane of existence or whatever. But <laughs> um, he, that is true. And now he has, of course, passed on. Indeed, yeah. in, entirely. Um, rest in peace, Steven Sondheim. Uh, that being said, uh, I think that the oh, we lost Santa Claus like permanently oh, yeah. in that season. Yeah, yeah. Um, th- so there's a lot of like really interesting things. I think position wise, one, I think that a crown of candy proved that these players have become very, very adaptable and smart in their in how they approach battles together. And uh, additional, unless, unless you throw an orange fair, a sexy orange fairy. Yeah, then they the, get distracted. Yeah, um, <laughs> then they just throw strategy completely out the window. <laughs> yep, so good. Because um, it's just like that the the conglomerate ADD brain or ADHD brain that that <laughs> that table has is just like. I don't know if it was that so much as thirst. I consider it one in the same. The fact mm. that you're not able to stop thinking about the thirst and are constantly distracted by the thirst. There's that. Um, no, there there was a level of just like obs- <laughs> obsession that came from the bit in the adventuring party before, which we talked about. We were like, if people didn't watch the adventuring party before, they have no idea. Yeah. Um, shout out to them also dressing like librarians, all of them dressing as librarians for the final episode. Yeah, that was fun. Um, you you love to see it. Uh, I think the only time I would say that there they have been more in, um, like a more succinct fight in the finale is starstruck i think their final fight in starstruck was like a real standout of them like going all out and showing off the talents that they had as players Mm -hmm. and really shoving that game down brennan's throat that entire season Mm -hmm. because they had like deeply read the rules to make sure like brennan couldn't be like or just so that brennan was off his toes um but brennan was on his toes this season and so are all the players and so we got to see like especially with the um the death blow rules being introduced this season yeah uh fantastic the like and also like the the mystery of the red the red gems uh just overall fantastic the way everything kind of came together for it um the two part finale of course uh with that final battle uh the you know the daughters of the crown uh following that up with the seven fairies and the verse and the authors 
And the stepmother. And the stepmother. Uh, the stepmother, I, f- I was really imagining the stepmother would be like a third phase mm. for some reason. I mean, like it kind of came in once the fairies were like almost completely knocked out. Yeah. It came in as like the big bad at the end. I thought it would be like also bigger for some reason. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I liked, I mean, and this is the, I love the thing, design of it though. Yeah. I, this is a thing that Brennan does a lot uh, where like I like the, the idea that, yeah, the first phase of that fight is, all right, you need to stop the, the, uh, the princesses. They rolled before, like they've, they're, you know, a few rounds into, you know, doing this and getting ready and getting set up and stuff like that. Um, so you kind of need to, and then like phase two is, all right, you need to undo all the work that they did while now you're, pl- you're on defense because the fairies are here. Um, and then I liked that once the authors and the stepmother got introduced, they weren't like, they're such meta things in that that they weren't necessarily focused on the team so much as like they were all focused on each other yeah and you also have the Baba Yaga in there is just pure chaos yeah um, uh, yeah it, it like he does a great job of kind of like giving each little faction like their objective and yeah some of them were were um, much more like ride or die with whatever their cause was, which is another element I liked about that final battle of like yes, a the, lot of the roles in that final battle aren't attack, they're persuasion. They're trying to like win people over to, you know, their side. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it made for a very dynamic uh, battle, I think, uh, over over the course of the two episodes. I really enjoyed that the characters who really believed in the nihilistic principles were not going to be convinced. Mm-hmm. Um I shouldn't say we're not like it wasn't set up to fail, but rather um, it was believable when they did not when the beast, for example, I think the beast is one of the most underrated characters this season um, in that. I love the idea that the like the princess is confessed to by the beast and the beast like I'm in love with you. And her response is, well, then let me devour you. And the idea that the beast was like, of course, and just like lets her devour him. Uh, uh, they, I mean, they, is, they distinctly left that open. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah. I, they, I, they mind, talk about it yeah. in one of the adventuring parties. Like, we don't know if oh, that's the, true. the yes. beast said yes or no. Oh, uh, uh, that's but true. But the, the Labette uh, devoured him nonetheless. True. So Labette, uh, I love that Labette was this, like, one had some of the most poignant moments. Um, Just. And then also the like the easiest death yeah um man when labette uh was like over it and it was just like like do not give me your pity like let like let let it be done what must be done like that that whole like i chose my side and i'm sticking to it Mm -hmm. make like do what you're going to do i mean like even that like if if emily had rolled oh yeah sure on that it would have easily been uh, you know, a, a switching sides kind of thing. So I think really the only one that like probably was a hard no was Snow White. Snow White and Rapunzel. Oh yeah, Rapunzel. Yeah, but it doesn't matter because Rapunzel got freaking eaten by Gerard. Indeed, yeah. Gerard I, was just like an absolute menace as a giant bullfrog. Yeah, I think that's another thing that I really loved about the final battle, especially just from where these characters all started. The, mm-hmm. the first TPK in uh, Dimension Twenty in that in that like second episode, yeah, um, where they just got completely wiped out, and then we introduced the like the multiverse idea, uh, which was just, like especially riding high off of everything everywhere all at once last season, and I like I've heard Brennan say in adventuring parties and stuff like that, mm-hmm. like he's a big fan of that movie, um, so like. I loved that, like, that was kind of how they incorporated, like, yeah, we're not going to be spinning up new characters like we did with Crown of Candy. It's going to be the same characters. And then it, it becomes this really interesting, like, well, what would have happened if only some of the characters died mm-hmm. and, and other, but obviously everyone dies in that first one. And I think over the course of the rest of the run, only Rosman dies again. Yeah, Rosman um, Rosman hits stage, no, uh, Rosman and... Um, well, Rosman hits stage three through death. Through death. Uh, Gerard and Ilfa, like, give up the humanity of themselves in yes. the bargaining with the Baba Yaga. Yeah. Yeah. That's their stage two to stage three, but their stage one to stage two was death. Yeah. So. Um, or, no, their stage wasn't stage. Their stage. I mean, yeah, everybody's stage one to stage two was the death in that first battle. I think if. Oh, no, no, you're right. Never mind. Sorry. I take it yeah. back. Yeah, no, the, the stage threeification. 
for the others did happen over that. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, shout out to them in the event final venture party showing off everybody's like final form miniatures. Oh, yeah. yeah. So good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like going going from that like just absolutely brutal like this is the setting the tone which again like that's that's very much where I got the like all right this is this entire season is going to be that Brennan energy of uh, I think my tweet was the like all right where do you feel your weakest at the elbow or the wrist <laughs> um uh for uh, Marisha's character in EXU Calamity before he rips their arm off at whatever Oh uh, was point. it the uh, was it the wrist or was it the elbow or the shoulder it was the elbow or the wrist. Or the elbow yeah. or the wrist, yeah. And she said, okay. uh, I think probably my, I think my, I think my wrist is stronger. Or, and he's like, all right, well then at your elbow, <laughs> yeah, at the elbow, your, your arm is just ripped off in there. That's it, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and like the whole, like, there's so much of a vibe of like that first, you know, two hours of the final episode that's like one second of damage ticking over uh, was the like horror. All right. Yeah. Like. You can get, uh, I mean, especially in the battles like um, the the battle where they are the giants and it's the, you know, the little subversion with Jack the Giant Killer kind of thing. Yes. Like, they were not under threat in that battle, t- like, by the enemies themselves. Just by the sheer number of attacks that yes. those enemies got meant there were way more chances of rolling a, a nat 20 and getting that critical, like, hit for a potential death blow. Where, uh, yeah, if they, it, I don't think they, like, that, that was one element. Like, I feel like they changed the death blow rules, like, in the final battle. Because it wasn't until the final battle I felt like I got introduced to the idea that, like, oh, it's an auto death if you fail by five or more. Um, uh, it was, uh, like, it always felt like it's an auto death if you fail the, the constitution save in earlier episodes. Um, and they just always managed to save. Um, well, I wonder if at some point there was like, okay, you guys have gotten strong enough now that that's not going to be like, there is going to be a, maybe. a different, like a differentiation yeah. or maybe there was an internal discussion like, Hey, it's maybe too brutal. Yeah. Like after Rosman dies the second time. I mean, um, it, but it like, it had been introduced before that. Like it gets, it, it gets introduced with Rapunzel in that like first hit. Uh, in the final battle. Oh, but no, that's what I'm saying is maybe after the discussion, oh. at, like Rosman goes after down. After she goes down in like the dogfish. Yeah, the, the dogfish one. Le, le dogfish terrible. Yeah, yeah, le dogfish terrible. Or, or, or no, it's supposed to be Italian, so. Le, le, le pescacine or something like that. Yeah. Whatever, whatever like Italian form dogfish was. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, no, for, I think after that, they might have like sat down and be like, hey, these might be too brutal. How do we like differentiate it a little bit? I mean, it, it, uh, even there, like, they were still rolling normally after the, like, Jack and the Giant Killer fight. So, um, yeah, maybe it was just the final battle. That's where they got introduced. I don't know. Uh, it, 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 but it was, a, it was a cool mechanic, and it definitely worked in their favor a couple times. Um, uh, and especially, like, the, the element in that final battle where it was, okay, if you fail... But by less than five, you just take that damage again at the at the start of, you know, the next turn or whatever. So Rapunzel, um, like, immediately gets, you know, put on death's door from Pib. Um, but she could have been taken out completely uh, out the gate there. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, even the, even the stepmother, I think, gets a critical, uh, gets a death blow on her, but uses a legendary resistance mm-hmm. to, to succeed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely a fun, fun final battle uh, across the board. Agreed. Uh, any any other highlights from across the season you want to uh, shout out or give some love to? Yes, I have several, but I will keep it limited to just a few. Um, one, I want to give a massive shout out to the um, the infamous sad Nat 20 that Lou had uh, <laughs> yeah. when he was alone. That entire session of them doing solo one-on-one sessions, kind of like an a utilizing this moment to do session zero work basically mm-hmm. um, was phenomenal. Um, I think the introduction to the lines between was incredible and really helps uh, establish that meta narrative that felt a bit vague up until that point. Like how does this work? What's going on? And I think that that the introduction of that like meta narrative, literally a meta palace <laughs> uh, of explanation of like what's going on in all these worlds, uh, the introduction of Shahrazad. Um, 
I almost said Abel, but uh, Aesop. Yeah. Aesop, yeah. When, yeah, when Scheherazade got introduced, I was like, that's really cool. Yes. That, like, it, like going off of, because obviously Mother Goose's book is, is you know, what we're, what, they're using as the basis for so many of the other kind of the Western um, uh, fairy tales that we, we see in there. So when we got Scheherazade and the Thousand and One Nights, um, I was like, oh, that's awesome. And then Aesop with the, yeah, like, keep it simple. Yeah, keep <laughs> um, it simple. It's so good. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great stuff there. Uh, um, uh, what was I going to? There was There was one I was going to. I was going to shout out there. Oh, oh the yeah. dogfish is another one for me. Like Do- yeah. the dogfish completely like usurping that battle mm-hmm. um, where you're like, okay, King Trident, here we go. And then it's like, nope, it's the dogfish battle. Yeah. And that entire like fighting a monstrosity is such a cool, especially when you don't know it's coming, that when it happens and having to like impromptu and improv that entire fight was super cool. Yeah. Um, one, uh, uh, one of the standout production elements I want to give uh, give some love to was and and like it was one of those things that like yeah horror wise it didn't bother me as a viewer if I'd been at that table I'd been like oh fuck you <laughs> uh, was the spider coming down during the Miss Muffet fight um, yes that was like just a nightmare <laughs> um, uh, but a great production uh, moment for for the team and then like nightmare part two the fact that like all of the little spiders came off of it. Oh yeah, that was so great. Yeah. Um lots of lots of great design stuff across all the fights. Even if like the fights weren't it, it, some of the fights weren't like as memorable, like one that I I find myself often kind of like, oh yeah, that was a thing that happened was like the uh the fight against the third little pig um uh, where with death stew. Mm-hmm. Um it's like, oh yeah, that was that was a thing that happened. There for weirdly like after that first fight, it it didn't feel like every fight was like a losing battle anymore. Like they they came back powered up, and yes. felt like now they like I mean it, meta wise they were like above the challenge rating that Brennan had set the encounters for. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because yeah, like a couple people drop, but like they came back. Especially I think. The fact that, like, everybody seemed to have a good berry in their pocket at all times that could bring them back to, like, one hit point, I think that really weakened the, like, horror and, like, oh, you can die at any time aspect of the campaign that I felt like they were going for. So maybe if, if yeah. like, that hadn't been a thing that could just save them all the time as much, um, I think that would have been... Uh, more in line with like the horror vibes they set up in those first couple episodes at least. Yeah. I think that the good berries was definitely like a great, uh, like player choice to keep the party alive. But I do think it did take away from the kind of like the drama yeah. of hey, this could happen at any moment. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that when it comes to the weaknesses of the season, it, I think it really comes down to the length and uh, breadth of the meta narrative getting so drawn out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, like ultimately, it comes down to like there are too many factions, almost too like, many factions. But I would also, I don't know if it was that there's too many factions so much as there is a level of how do I put this? There is a level of there's there's not that there's too many number of factions it's that the number the factions are all working on different layers that don't necessarily have them directly in conflict with each other a hundred percent of the time so you have like the stepmother who's operating in a rivalry against the authors the authors who are uh, like don't know what's going on and don't know that the stepmother's playing against them you have the the gander um operating on a one I, I just even forgot about yeah right the now. gander the, by the way gander mini is so cool and i was like that's the most amazing badass mini i've ever seen and then i saw the goose feet on it <laughs> it was like oh there it is there's the there's the dimension 20 uh like funny thing about it i uh, didn't hear what you said because you, uh, you laughed over your own words the gander feet like the gander's feet of oh. the like this badass like almost phoenix looking like mini and then it has like giant goose feet um just made me makes me crack up when i think about it um whenever i think about it it just makes me laugh uh the the way that like okay and the the way the party's kind of like in between everybody 
they're in conf they're technically in conflict with all these different parties and all these different factions mm -hmm. but there's never a like starstruck worked with how many factions there were because they were all working on the singular plane right like they were all working on that interplanetary level of traversal and positioning and influence or there were they, like there were specific members of each faction or like uh, of of the starstruck crew that had relationships with the factions um yeah like like zach's character having a specific relationship with the arcadians and with like the the slug people it's like okay yeah i'm i'm bought into that whereas yeah i think there were there like nobody i guess Pinocchio starts with a, a relationship with the fairies, but very quickly kind of like his focus is on the stepmother. So nobody's really connected to the fairies and the yeah. fairies are gone for like half the story. It's so when of, they pop yeah. up at the, at the end, it's like, Oh yeah, that's right. They're also in this fight. <laughs> well, I think part of that is one, the, the fairies immediately get usurped as a big bad by the stepmother. Yeah. Um, also you never met most of those fairies. So there's no like actual attachment to any of them. Um, except the fairy with the turquoise hair, um, and of course, orange top hat fairy, um, moth fairy too. Uh, there, there is a level of the, um, uh, also like the princesses, the majority of the princesses don't show up until like the last like quarter of the episodes, yeah. um, outside of Cinderella showing up I think one it, in one episode and see episode three. Yeah, I think, but I think with the princesses, you you can like you can identify who those princesses are True. early on like obviously yeah cinderella gets introduced and then like snow white gets name dropped um i don't remember if rapunzel gets name dropped immediately but like they they kind of you know the 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 princess by the sea it's like oh, okay that's going to be mira in this case um with the little mermaid princess uh, obviously rosamond sleeping beauty there uh, so you like you're able to like because we all grew up with disney you're able to like pick and choose which princesses they're going to go with. Um, whereas like the fairies are much more nondescript. Yeah. Uh, and then, so like, yeah, the fairies end up being like usurped, I think in large part by Baba Yaga as well. Oh yes. True. And specifically Emily's like, like we need to do whatever we need to do to see the Baba Yaga. Like, and that being her kind of whole driving force completely like, you know, uh, uh, metagaming and not what, Ilfa, Ilfa would want to do or care about <laughs> um, just the, the fact that Emily's other pitched character was the Baba oh, Yaga. Yaga. Yeah, wanting to see why she couldn't... <laughs> well, the Baba Yaga was like her first pitch. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's all of that. Uh, I will say also that there is aspects about... Um, about the... Uh, how do I put this... There are also so many characters that get introduced this season. Mm -hmm. We literally lose Scheherazade, Aesop. Like, Sinbad doesn't even show up in the, in the final battle. Yeah. Um, he's just completely absent. Um, with his, like, 100 men, like he also had. So, uh, like, there's, there's a lot of, like, aspects of characters that kind of get dropped. Um, but I think the biggest issue that they have is also the stakes about what's about the world itself and, like, the kind of, like, amb ambiguous kind of motivate like not motivations but the ambiguous kind of like group motivation to continue forward always felt somewhat nebulous like they didn't know their their whole goal was kind of like we got to figure out what's going on not okay we have we know what's going on where do we stand on that mm -hmm. yeah. um we don't get that until far late into the season yeah. um because we spend so much time in this meta like the meta narrative um, and exploring it, it's such a it's such a deep concept that by the time they finish it, we're in episode. I mean, yeah, it was like I remember thinking in episode like fifteen or sixteen, being like, "Where is this going to end? Like, yeah. where are we going from here? <laughs> There's only a few episodes left. What does that look like? Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, yeah. So like the introduction of the princesses being nihilists and wanting to destroy everything, to also like. It, it felt like, okay, we need to bring in more of a, like, more aspects about, um, like, more aspects about, like, to make characters care. Uh, but, and I think another thing about it is, not, not, I shouldn't say it like that. That makes it, I think the way I was thinking about it for just a second there was a bit too pessimistic about kind of, like, the, the choices of bringing in uh, Elodie and Henry 
and Jack. Um, I don't think that was done for a contrivance. I do think that that was like Elodie was always going to be one of the princesses, I think. Mm-hmm. And then Henry also, it's like Henry was kind of doing the thing that like, yeah, he was doing the kind of NPC thing where he was kind of following the leads that you guys had in your first few episodes that you lost because you died. Um, I think for me, part of that is also the, um, because there was the TPK and we get thrust into this meta narrative, it made the kind of crises and, uh, issues that each of the characters were dealing with so much broader that there wasn't a more focused driving, um, push because it, all of a sudden the things that really, really mattered that they cared about when they were introduced suddenly stop mattering as much when you realize, oh, that was just one of me. And that there's this larger this larger thing that kind of gets, so the personal motivations get lost. Yeah, I think that's, that's also an, an aspect, I think, of just the fairy tale, like, theme in general is, and it's, it's something they touch on many times over the course of the series, is like, from the source material, a lot of these characters are very thinly written. Like, Sleeping Beauty has no agency in her own story. So what is she like? What is her arc going to be? Oh, it's <clears throat> the true love doesn't exist. Okay, even that's like a a very basic arc. Go if if you're going from your your story is predestined to have true love to thinking well true love does, isn't a thing. It's like okay, you just kind of flipped that that switch. Um, uh, and like they, I mean, they touch on in a lot of the adventuring parties the idea that like. Little Red and Pinocchio, the whole moral of their story is like, be good kids. And, uh, and, and like, it's like, that's, yeah, that's, that's unfair that like perfection is the only solution. Um, uh, that, so like, I liked, um, their arcs in particular kind of being, um, like Pinocchio giving up being a real boy, um, and, uh, to, one of the points you were bringing up uh, in the spoiler free stuff, mm-hmm. like, like I, th- I think Gerard's arc as well, I think is, is probably one of the, the stronger ones. Um, yeah. The way they think- explore kind of like the, um, the, the fact that both Gerard and Elodie were kind of held hostage in a marriage because of their fairy tale. Because of, hep- yeah, because of happily ever after. Ha- not only happily ever after, but also like their story is they only like, you learn the lesson just in time for you to not have needed to learn the lesson. Yep, yeah, learn the lesson. And then also on top of that, it's, okay, cool. Well, was it really true love or is it you, the contrivance of your your environment and situation necessitated that Gerard and Elodie be in love to make the kiss be true love's kiss and make that work? Like, there's a contrivance to their relationship where basically they were thrown into it by quote unquote destiny and they never actually got to grow and learn and love each other in a way that was normal and natural. And so their ending being, we both kind of kind of figure out who we are, but we still care about each other, but we're just not like, we just need to do it as individuals, not as a married couple, I think is a very cool way to end that. Um, because they could have gone in a way that was very different. And I appreciated where they kind of went with it instead. Mm-hmm. Um, that it was, Hey, it's not that this marriage was, fo- is falling apart because like, I'm a bad husband. It's we really like, it's not it's, oh, no, it, like, Oh yeah. Oh no, 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 mean, no, no, no. It was Gerard, Gerard is a, a very yes. superficial character at the beginning. And, yes. 100%. Yeah. Sorry. I don't want to excuse Gerard's actions prior to the game starting when he was the prince. Um, but also, like, his expectations for what a prince should be was all, were also very childish because he didn't really grow up. He was a frog for all of his... For the years that he should have been developing as a person, as a prince, as a leader, yeah. he was a frog. Yeah, there, there, it's, it's like there are elements of, like, if you think about the beast, realistically, of like, oh, that kid got turned into a beast when he was a kid because mm-hmm. he was rude to a stranger... Like fuck that, he is. Is. and then he becomes a he, yeah. He's he's forced into being a beast for his like developing years. Yeah, I think my favorite thing it was like an after hours from Crack dot com. They're like, wait, that was his twenty first birthday. How old was he? And it's like, wait a minute, how come he was the one answering the door? He's answering the door late at night 
on a stormy evening and he's doing the smart thing of not trusting a stranger, a weird old lady who is like, let me into your castle. And then she turns out to be a fairy and curses him instead. And it's like, yeah, no, like, yeah, no, that that's that's really messed up. Yeah. Um, I thought that would have been a little interesting if they had explored, explored that with Labette. Like, oh, so he was like crazy and kidnapping. It's like, uh, y- yeah, but also he was like not like he did not have the best situation either. Yeah. I th- and I think that's like the I mean, the, the flexibility is like, oh, you could have like I, I could very easily see Brennan going down that route if Labette had been a more you know, prominent character if they'd spent more time with him or if they'd like really delved into that aspect of her backstory. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it is, there were just so many characters that like all of them end up getting a little bit of short shrift and it is okay. We're, we're playing with the tropes of these and we're going to subvert the tropes of these, but we only have a very limited amount of time. So we got to do that all very, very quick. Yep. Uh, overall, like though, I th- still think the, like, the play is solid. Everybody's play is solid, whether it's in, in combat episodes, whether it's... I think it was very interesting seeing Zack be a, a rogue, but being a rogue with throwing weapons. It's not very often you see somebody dedicated to throwing weapons, and mm-hmm. getting to see that was very, very cool. Yeah. I mean, it, it, given that uh, among the critical role stuff I watched, uh, uh, Vax is... Uh, Vax? Vaxeldon... Yeah, Vaxeldon. Vax, uh, Liam O'Brien's character in the first campaign, is his whole thing is dagger, 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 and he's like throwing daggers at characters. Oh, cool! Okay. And the daggers like magically come back to him. So that's it sick. is like a vibe I was <laughs> I was uh, accustomed to and used to from that. Um, I was not. I've actually always been a proponent of like I've always wanted to see more trick weapons and more um, and more like throw throwing weapons like object like. Weapons that aren't, I have it in my hand and I hit somebody with it. Mm-hmm. I think the more variety we get with that because I feel like that's a bit lacking in D&D. Um, but there are a ways to go about it. Like him getting sharpshooter and as a throwing, like for throwing daggers is awesome. Yeah. Um, it, like it's overall really, really great. So. Yeah. Um, mechanically, yeah. The, the characters, I think like, I mean, having Ilfa as a druid mixed with barbarian meant she was, you know, an HP sync for so many of those combat episodes um, and could be the super tank that, like, they needed after that first battle. Even in yeah. that first battle, she's a super tank already. Um, but, yeah, like, the fact that she just kind of get got to keep doing that um, uh, over the, the rest of the season, I think, was, like, a, a, a fun-inspired choice uh, for Emily. Um, you know, when she's, when, like, she's, She'll break the game absolutely if you give her spells. Uh, yes. So instead, uh, here was a different way she broke the game. Yep, which um, is great. Um, it is also to note uh, something that in the D one D and D they're taking away. So, hmm. um, um, that that announcement came like right after she had done the like the the HP sync episode with the um uh little spider. I did. I, I don't know what you're. Oh, so what the, you're referencing in so. In, in the mechanics of it, the way that her wild shape, yeah. she gets a new HP pool yeah. that stacks on top of her actual HP pool. That is going away in, in the next iteration of D&D. Oh, that's dumb. Um, it, yeah, yes and I, I, yes I feel like no. that's one of the selling points of a druid. <laughs> it is one of the selling points of the druid, it, but it is something that um, it's now, it's they're not taking it away entirely. They are just, instead of it being like an extra HP pool stacked on top of yours, I think they're doing it where it just adds tempic hp instead um which means that it can be taken away for different like different varieties of reasons okay. um yeah I, I think i think what really broke it here was that it was an extra hp hp pool that was halved because of rage yes uh, the entire time for yeah. sure that was definitely a thing um, but yeah like uh seeing murph as uh as a fighter was a lot of fun um, seeing murph as a fighter who was well so technically his um eldritch knight was a fighter as well in uh crown of candy Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I guess seeing him like s- going all in on the maneuvering attacks and stuff like that, especially in in the, you know, my broader spectrum of also watching Liam in campaign three, where Liam is a is a fighter character, halfling fighter. And so he's out there doing all sorts of maneuvering attacks. And, and oh, is he like, a battle master as well? 
Yeah. Nice. Um, uh, he's out there constantly like, all right, uh, I use bait and switch. So I, you know, I mm -hmm. up my, you know, my allies H, uh, uh, AC and, and stuff like that. And so seeing, um, yeah, seeing uh, uh, Murph kind of like have fun with those. And specifically like the, the commander's strike. Commander's strike is That great. he was doing that was like, all right, I don't, I'm not good at this. So I'm going to give my allies who are better at this another action was like, I thought that just really played into his character as well as uh, yes. in, in a fun and interesting way too. Seeing a delegating fighter battle, battle master was a trip and a half. I really enjoyed it. And I thought that was a fantastic way to do a, a general type character. And I found it very we, funny that he fell into that. Yeah. Especially cause that is like, it's the it's the like the meta realization of like if Elodie knew that version of Gerard, like she would probably be more head over heels for him because like that's that's the the war guy that she wanted uh, by her side at the war table and stuff like that. Well, I don't. I think part of that is also like yeah, she wanted that, she needed that guy, and yeah. he wasn't that guy at that time, and he became the guy that she needed. Yeah. But I also think that speaks to the larger emphasis of their relationship being we need to we need to fulfill these roles for each other mm -hmm. rather than we need to be who we are in our relationship and be and love that and appreciate that which i think they did have but it got strained over bad decisions especially that gerard made yeah uh i think lou was probably the mvp of the season 100 percent um not only just from pinocchio from the jump pinocchio having the huh? kind of thing the entire season. so good when he introduced that it was the best and then yeah. it kept being the best because you could tell there were points where he was like um i don't want to be doing this i don't voice, want to be doing I'm this gonna do the voice. he's like it's yeah. the voice is it i chose it early on i'm sticking with it shout out to will for sticking with it and lou, lou yeah lou oh who did i you said will will oh sorry lou lou wilson yeah lou yeah there you um, go. yeah uh yeah, like that that was a ton of fun. He had uh like I think so many of like the clutch nat twenties this season, including the like very sad nat twenty that you alluded to earlier. Um uh but yeah, it like hit it was in it like I think you and I have talked a little bit, like mechanically I don't have much interest in playing a warlock um mm -hmm. uh myself but i thought this was like a cool fun way of doing warlock and and the like bouncing from the stepmother as his patron to like his own book as his own patron or like yes. the blue fairy slash destiny slash whatever like it was a it, it led to a cool series of story moments for him even so like that also meant that, like, when Geppetto showed up at the end, I was like, oh, that's right. Like, he's also <laughs> been missing Geppetto this whole time. That's what he was fighting for, kind of, in the beat. Like, there there were elements to that that did, like, sacrifice other story beats. But, um, yeah, like, him and Cricket was just a ton of fun. Cricket, um, don't drink the, don't drink water. Don't drink water, yeah. Uh, um, the, also, shout out to the, uh, like, him using his firework to break Alphonse's curse. Yeah, the, like, all of the firework stuff was a ton of fun. The, the constant callbacks to bubble gum and whiskey um when he's smoking the cigar with cigars, snow yeah. white is an iconic cinderella. scene cinderella sorry yeah, yeah cinderella. His, his stepsister his stepsister <laughs> hey stepsis <laughs> just hey, hey, hey. just, um, just yeah. that that level of just like the smoking of the cigar the whiskey drinking and it's like listen i might sound cavalier about it right now but it's like that it was insane yeah. i loved it so much the i mean like even from the jump all of the like Prince of Schuberg stuff yes. uh, from that first episode, <laughs> like, uh, but they, and they, I think they turned it into a thing like chaotic entitled, um, as his, uh, um, uh, his, his, uh, alignment, um, uh, like so much fun there. Uh, like some just, uh, I mean, Lou continues to like, I remember it's, it's fascinating now with my journey of dimension 20. Like I remember, being put off by Lou initially in Fantasy High because I felt like he was like the of of everybody else he was the one being a character and doing a voice and all that stuff as Fabian mm -hmm. um, and it was like a weird like I wasn't ready to jump in to that element yet um, but like uh, as I've just continued to see him you know go to to um, uh, on Sleeping City and everything else that he's done and now what he's doing with uh, Worlds Beyond Number, what he did in EXU Calamity. Um, like, he, yeah, he's one of my all-time favorite players and Pinocchio was just yet another one of those. 
uh, uh, chaotic, <laughs> crazy bastards. Um, yeah, lots of fun there. Um, yeah, I mean, like the the real standout thing I think again that I keep going back to is is like how cool they made moments with Brennan like talking about the seams and the rips and stuff like that and just like the visual like cuts and tears and how they edited so many of those moments together it was just yeah lots of lots of cool shit there uh any um any last moments or any final bits you want to chat about before we wrap up no i think that's it yeah like a good season and definitely like lots to discuss and we had like a ton of fun again like watching it week in week out chatting about like the elements that we liked um but yeah i think i think it was there there were just aspects of too much and because there was too much it gave the players like too many options to try and go like i mean there's like the the, one of the on rails kind of things i i was kind of referencing earlier is like all right um we're going up uh all right uh death is is you know going to help seek out the babiaga with you guys but we need to get you back down to the (laughs) the toy island fight so we're gonna go all the way up there uh, and you're gonna meet Snow White, and I'm gonna send Death off on this other thing, uh, and Snow White's going to send you all the way back down through the Northern Wind kind of thing, and it's like, okay, that's, yeah, that's nowhere near where they were. It, like, because it, especially so much of that was like, all right, you gave them an option to go north, or you gave them the option to go to the Toy, uh, toy Island fight, and everybody was like, well, it feels like that, it feels like north is the thing we got to do. We'll, we'll go and do the Toy Island uh, stuff later. Uh, and it was like, nope, you got to go do the Toy Island stuff now. Yeah, um, definitely felt that. Um, also, I feel like the. No, because I think the TPK kind of like pushed that into that direction. So never mind. I take that back. I do think yours is probably the best example of that. Yeah. I mean, the, the, oh, you, oh, you know what? It might have been. Um, you guys are just running, running north, uh, and to the, to get into the giants' fight as well. Yeah, yeah. The the horses are just like, you know, kind of driving you into the clouds and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the giant fight was a fun subversion, though. I did, I did appreciate that. Of like, all right, they're they're the ones going down the beanstalk, and they are the giants. Um, that was fantastic. Though. Yeah, that was a cool because it led to some of the best ones, which is also um, Jack the Giant Slayer. Yeah, being like, "Are you insulting me by saying you're my father?" Yeah, uh, the, uh, the another uh, Pinocchio MVP element that I, uh, oh, I the, was I was yes. driving towards uh, when I shouted him out was the animate objects spell that he used both in that fight and then in the final battle uh, was just such a fun like. A, f- a fun thing to do. All right, I want to animate the tower. <laughs> yes. All right, yep, you can do that. <laughs> and just watch it, like, just crush and kill. <laughs> yeah. All right, and these mages have one hit point, <laughs> so you just need to hit them. Yep. Uh, yeah, lots of lots of cool ideas there uh, that I just, yeah, I, like, and it's not even that the execution of them was bad. It was just that, they, like, they'd spread so many elements so thin that yeah it was hard to be like all right now we need to start wrapping all of this up and so what are you guys going to do if you get the ink uh, i don't know because we don't want to we don't want to just kill ourselves i guess we want to do the whole everybody writes their own story kind of thing i guess that's what we're going to go with once again this party leans deeply into the democratization of power which is always a great choice yeah so um all right. Well, I think that will do it for this episode. Thank you, Cam, for joining me to talk all about Dimension 20's Never After season. Uh, you can, uh, go around our uh, real table with any actual plugs we have. You can follow Cameron at RevCabot, two Bs and two Ts. Anything you want to give a shout out to there, Cam? Yeah, a massive shout out to, um, I just recorded a few more episodes of Jedi Fallen Order, Jafo. Um, a let's play series that we're doing here. And from what I understand, I'm coming into the, towards the end of the game. Um, so I'm excited. I'll like, probably not, maybe, I don't know. We'll see. Um, I saw somebody else who's been doing, who has been doing let's plays as well. Finished the game. Andy. Yeah. Andy finished the game. And I was like, well, I'm not that far behind him, but then again, like we're still probably talking like, you know, three to five hours. Yeah. Especially like, I, I don't know what Andy's doing in terms of like, you know, going and trying to find everything. I don't know what you're doing in terms of going and trying to find everything. I am not. Yeah. Then, so. then yeah, you, you, 
you could very well be near the end. Um, yeah. Uh, shout out to our Jedi Fallen Order series. You follow me at Trevor J. Starkey on Twitter. Uh, in addition to that, I will shout out our Elden Ring uh, series, which is continuing to go on. Uh, we did we we started that back up uh, after a month in real world's time away from the game, but we came back to that this last week for the next few episodes uh, and maybe we'll sit down and record some more after we're done with this podcast who knows uh and then also um on thursdays you can go watch uh my replay of breath of the wild which will be timed out so that the final episode of aka like going and fighting ganon will basically be right before tears of the kingdom launches so uh if you are looking to kind of get your breath of the wild fix but don't want to hop back into the full game go watch my let's play my replay of the series uh and you can get the the highlights um so yeah go check that out uh on thursday so yeah our our ongoing series on tuesday wednesday thursday for let's plays obviously this podcast here on mondays uh and that d plus show over on fridays we just wrapped up uh our pirates of the caribbean series of films so if you wanted to watch any of those you can go check out those episodes uh this week will be the mandalorian season three uh, as that wraps up uh and then we got we're gonna have like uh star wars visions in a couple weeks we're gonna do princess bride next week because uh, i feel bad for making cameron watch all of the pirates of the caribbean movies <laughs> uh so uh so yeah we got uh, a fun lineup there on that d plus show as well so go check out all of our stuff monday through friday youtube.com slash that nerdy site uh or you know podcast services for a couple of those things uh, you follow all of us over at that nerdy site or go to that nerdy site.com for all the latest from us once again if you liked what you heard please remember to like subscribe rate review share the podcast with your friends ring notification bells all of that good stuff thank you for listening as always stay nerdy and be good to each other see you in the stars see you in the stars <laughs>